All right, everyone, thank you for joining. As I mentioned, uh, today we'll be covering a data layer deep dive, really going into uh, what the data layer is, what should be included in it, structure, key data points, and then also some technical implementation items uh, to keep in mind and um, really how to best structure it and inform it for your website. Taking care of some basic housekeeping items just about us. Um, presenting today is myself, Lucas Long. I'm the Tag Inspector Product Manager and also a Tag Management Consultant. I also have with me here today, Tyler Blatt. Hello, who, everybody. <laughs> Tyler is uh, one of our analytics engineers, also handles quite a bit with technical tag management, both architecting data layers, implementing them, um, and rolling them out at a global scale across thousands of sites. So um, he's definitely the guy to talk with regarding any sort of technical specifics of, of a data layer. Um, as always, this webinar is brought to you by InfoTrust and Tag Inspector. Um, Tag Inspector specifically is a product of InfoTrust. You see some information there, uh, just a little bit of background. We work with thousands of sites, do a number of trainings, including these educational webinars, um, and have offices both here in Cincinnati, in the US, as well as in Dubai. So to get started here, just a quick agenda and a run through of some of the different items that we'll be covering. Um, but one thing also just to keep in mind, we have turned out a little bit of a different structure here today, um, a little bit more informal uh, where Tyler and I will be going through each of these points, um, talking about you know the, the main keys for each, but please, um, drop questions as we go along. More than happy to answer any questions as we're going through each section. Um, you can drop those questions into the questions pane in the GoToWebinar menu. Uh, you should see a little drop down there. I'll be monitoring this throughout, and we can always turn this into um, a little bit more of a discussion sort of webinar. We want to be as helpful as possible. To quickly run through the different items that we will be covering here today, uh, first, just the overview. So at a high, high level, what is the data layer? How does it work? What is the structure? That sort of thing. Going through what the importance is, so why you should have one on your site yesterday. Um, going through the structure, uh, so what goes into actually architecting that the data layer that you're gonna implement on your website. You know, what is that measurement plan? What goes into that? What are some things to keep in mind? And then how should you break that down and structure it? Um, and then the technical aspects of actually getting it into that object on the page to make it most useful for you moving forward um, in, in managing tags and, and really managing all the data on your websites with that. Um, we'll also then go through some technical implementation items. We'll talk about leveraging that data layer with your tag management system. And then at the end, any final questions um, and summary, we will cover as well. <coughs> Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties early. Uh, question <laughs> pane jumped up on me on the actual screen. Um, someone already starting early with questions. This is great. Will there be a recording? Yes, there will. We're recording right now. We'll send that out at the end. Um, so yeah, but please stay with us. <laughs> All right, getting right into it now, uh, in terms of the overview. So what is the data layer? How does it work? What is that application with the tag management system? Now this photo here is one of the best photos that I've ever seen for, in terms of a visual, um, and big hat tip to our friends over at Telium for putting this together. Um, the data layer is just an object layer that sits between the back ends of your website, um, not visible to the user, um, sits below that application layer of what's actually visible to the user and plugs into all the different back end systems that you're working with. So why this is important and, and why this works is as opposed to having to reference a lot of different things on the website, um, and on your back end, you might have your e-commerce information in one place, your page content information within the CMS, um, other stuff just there within the HTML. 
So you're not having to scrape the different areas and pull in from a lot of different places within your tags. You can get everything in one central place that is the data layer and then start referencing that data layer uh, for all the different tags uh, and different pixels that you have collecting information on your site. One of the uh, one of the best ways I've ever heard this described for at least for non-technical people is the data layer is a bucket. You can think of all of the different tags and things that you have going on on your site that might need to use user ID. They might need a product ID. They might need, they might need things from all over the place. And what a lot of people are doing pre-data layer, uh, which is why Lucas said you need this yesterday, is you're managing lots of buckets. You have all these different buckets and you're trying to find out, well, I've got my product bucket over here. I got my user information bucket over here. I got my page data bucket over here. And there are all these different things and you're, you're constantly having to interact with different teams. and what the data layer does is kind of combines all that into one big bucket. And if you need a user ID, you go to one place. If you need page data, you go to one place. So a data layer is about taking all of this information that's feeding into, you can see on the bottom of our infographic here, all these different sources that we're feeding into that might be, you know, your social media or your analytics platform or your CMS, all these different things that we're plugging into. Uh, we're, we're setting what that, that blue layer that it's plugging into. We're setting one bucket that, that kind of gets all the information from the page and then can be the the source of truth, if you will, for the rest of our uh, our implementation. Yep. And kind of piggybacking off that same idea, um, a little bit of a, well, one, here's just a, a look at, as we talk about what the data layer is, so as you can really visualize, um, and we'll get into, I see a couple questions um, in regards to implementation and how this works and is it, Go on every page. We'll get into some of those technical specifics here in a minute. Uh, but as you just work to and we work through this, this can help you visualize, you know, what it is, right? It's just um, a JavaScript object on a page that contains all of that different information from those different sources, and you're able to simply go and reference this one one central place. And real quick, uh, just this this page might look kind of scary to someone that doesn't understand code. But you can think of it as uh, you can clearly see the the items here that are items, name, an attribute, and a value. All an object is is a collection of attributes and values. So an attribute being uh, the bottom one of our, our first position here says user type and guest. So you can think of that as being an attribute as user type. And then we know the, the value of our, our type of user is a guest. And all the data layer is, is you know, a bucket or an array for the people that technically understand arrays of these types of values. And whatever the last value set is, is what we'll be able to access in our TMS. We'll get into that a little bit deeper, but just in case this looks really scary to you, I just want you to know all this is is a collection of attributes and values. And one easy way to think about this here um, and another more real world visual is on the left is what my garage <laughs> typically <laughs> looks like. You have stuff all over the place, right? So with Tyler's point of a bucket, um, there's everything that you would need for any sort of a project um, in the garage example, any sort of household project. If you need to mow the grass, if you need to, uh, you know, fix a window or do something with your car. All those tools are there. Everything that you need in order to accomplish those tasks are there. But going through, finding them, getting everything organized and being able to pull them out to actually make them usable is difficult. What the data layer allows you to do is really organize everything in one place. So there's a central location for you to be able to go and reference those different key value pairs, those different data points. Um, so it really simplifies the process, saving you a lot of time as you're working on these different projects or tag implementations um, or data collection endeavors. And it has everything in one neatly organized place for you to go to be able to grab each tool or each data point and put it to use for whatever the platform is or whatever the purpose is that you're um, needing to work on. Um, I have a question here. Someone asking about the bucket analogy being the tag management system. Um, kind so of. Uh, yeah, I can take that. Uh, essentially, it's what the tag management system is going to use. Uh, when and we'll we'll give some examples later about working with the TMS, and I'll probably lean a little bit more towards Google Tag Manager as far as how I'm explaining it. But it, it works really with any TMS. 
Uh, you think about a TMS, there's going to be a way to read values, whether they're JavaScript values, whether you're using, whether the TMS has an integration with the data layer. Uh, however, there's a, they're called variables, macros. Essentially what they are is they're singular values to be used in a tag uh, in a TMS. And what we're doing with the bucket is we're pulling those values into one place. So rather than you having to uh, set up to read this value here, this value here, this thing here. Um, another thing that we didn't say about just the bucket example, and it doesn't really fit into that example as well. The data layer also manages state change, which are things that when, when the state changes, it might be a new page load in an Angular app that isn't actually a page load. It might be clicking on a form uh, to submit a user ID. Uh, or, or some kind of thing. Whenever these different kind of page state changes happen, the data layer also controls that. So we're controlling all of the data and state change from a centralized place. But yes, in the bucket system, uh, it's the data layer is the data layer. It's the object that holds the data, not just the TMS, but it's 100% what feeds into the TMS. And that infographic that he showed where the bottom was all of the tags, the data layer would be the line feeding into that infographic and the TMS would be the, uh, the bottom level where you have all of the tags. Yeah, and you can really think about, and I know the bucket analogy is used quite often with the tag management system. The tag management system, that is the bucket that's holding all of your tags, your firing rules, your triggers, um, and then the variables. Whereas the data layer is more that bucket holding all the actual data attributes that are being referenced by everything that is within that, that TMS. So it's almost like two buckets, two layers, hence the data layer, um, that sit on top of each other and, and really work together in order to greatly simplify this process. In terms of importance, it should be pretty clear, um, even just going through with the overview, but what managing all of this information in one place allows you to do is really clean everything up. If you put forth a very good measurement plan, you architect that data layer well, everything that you would possibly need for the different tags and pixels um, and data collection on your website is going to be contained there. Both things such as the events uh, for user interactions, when those are getting pushed to the data layer, um, so you can manage your firing rules and your triggers, as well as all data attributes, such as on an e-commerce site, your product name, product attributes that can then be pulled in by the different, um, different tags and different pixels that you're managing within a tag management system. So it's a central place for everything. One thing for everything to reference, which then extends to um, the cleanliness of data in all of your different platforms. It makes for very easy troubleshooting and management because if you have an issue with one particular thing or within one piece of reporting that you might be leveraging every single day and that you're gonna be more apt and quick to finding discrepancies in, that's also then gonna to translate to other tools um, and other platforms because you're referencing the exact same data point. Uh, this also helps uh, another thing a lot of clients are starting to move into, especially once they really get everything cleaned up with the central data layer and with the tag management system, is integration on the back end between a lot of the different platforms that are in use and having that central data layer all the data again is in the same format it's being referenced from the same place which makes all of that integration after the fact um, a lot a lot simpler as well um, in addition to just that easy troubleshooting and management. I want to give kind of an example on just the first three points on this slide. So you're referencing one thing and that one thing is in a central place and it's cleaner. So let's pretend uh, you have an, a huge uh, AdWords campaign coming out. you got a lot of money going into this AdWords campaign and it's, you tell your developers, we need to bring in user ID. Well, if, we have a system where there's five tags already using user ID and they're all referencing from the same data layer, the same central place, then we know that that AdWords tag, that using that same place, that same value, is going to have a vetted user ID. But if you just hand it off to your devs and tell them to implement it, there might be errors with this. There might be five different tags pulling user ID from five different places. Now, if one of those breaks, we have no idea. We might have just lost tracking on all of our campaigns. But if we have user ID, tested and proven to be tracking in one place. If it goes down, 
someone from all of these tags is going to notice it going down and we're going to get it fixed immediately. But we're, so it, it kind of brings everyone together to where you have this unified system of everybody's making sure that we keep this standard, that the values are always set and that we really don't have any issues with code changes or anything. It's, it, it kind of, it makes it a much more solid architecture and way more sustainable. And for that sustainability piece, and also with just the ease, once everything is managed in one place, and you're able to train even marketing and analytics folks on how exactly to reference that data layer, how your tag management system works with it. So when we talk about the transition of tag management and one of the main original um, selling points and benefit value propositions of, of leveraging a tag management system is to ease the burden on the development team when it comes to tracking tags and tracking pistol pixels. And that is what the data layer allows you to do. Um, you don't have to be dealing with, with code anymore and with jQuery anymore in order to be able to search for different things on a page and elements and scraping it. Um, it takes a little bit, very short amount of training. Um, and then because of that ease of use, you're able to, to leverage others within the organization for tag management. So getting now into a little bit more of the technical details. Um, we promised a deep dive and we wanna start diving. So with the structure, um, two main things, one up front, something to keep in mind, the measurement plan. Um, as with anything else, your data layer is only gonna be as good as the structure and the data that you're putting into it. Um, you can have a well-organized in like the garage example up there. You can have everything um, and it might be clear to you, but it needs to be clear for everyone and it needs to be easy to use. So a lot of that is upfront with the measurement plan, which we'll get into, and then also into some of these technical aspects um, for what is necessary on what pages does it need to be initialized on, uh, where does it need to be initialized, and then how exactly does it work for things like user interactions um, and different events that might happen on, on a web page. So to get started, when we talk about the measurement plan, where do you start, right? There's so many different things on the website. There are so many different purposes, so many different types of pages. It can be overwhelming at times. So where we always urge people to start is take an inventory of all the different tags and pixels and platforms that you're using on your website. What are the different tools that are going to be leveraging the data layer? A lot of times people will get into, oh, we would love to have this data point, this data point, this data point. And a lot of times those things are not even able to be collected by the different platforms that you're using. There's no use, um, you know, it's like the old saying, if a tree falls, in the woods uh, and no one hears it happen, did it actually happen? I mean, if you're expending a lot of effort in order to be able to surface some data point that nothing is even leveraging, you know, is that data point even real <laughs> or is it kind of a figment of, of your imagination? So the first thing is taking that inventory of all the different tags on your website and figuring out what's necessary for each. What are the different data requirements? What type of user information is possible to be collected and able to be collected and do I need? What sort of page information do I need for you know, conditionally firing these different, different tags? Is it, are all the tags on my site something where I just have deployed on all pages? And maybe at this point, I don't need to segment out page type or page name in order to be able to collect those data points. Um, also need to start thinking about what are the different types of events and interactions you want to track. What clicks, what form downloads, what um, transactions are wanted to be tracked. And we need to start thinking about pushing, as we'll get to um, what exactly that means, but we need to start thinking about, okay, how exactly are we going to track these and what attributes do we want attached to these different events and interactions on the website? Um, and then again, for all of those events and interactions, what are those data points that we need for each? And we really need to map this out. To, to go really, really high level on this, um, you can think of the data layer as a listener. That's ultimately what it is. It listens either for values or for events, which could be classified as state change. And, and kind of what uh, Lucas was, was prefacing, 
uh, there's all of these different state changes that we're interested in on a page. Uh, it could be form downloads, it could be link clicks, it could be uh, header clicks, it could be anything that you're interested in on your website is a state change. It's a user interaction, and that's done with the data layer through events. And then obviously we cover the values, uh, but essentially you're also setting values. So per each event, there might be some custom values, but when you're when you're coming up with a plan for the, your structure, you need to determine for each implementation phase how much effort is it for your technical team to get in the events and values for the things that you want to track. And that's ultimately, uh, and you'll find your technical team will most likely be more than happy to put forth the effort to determine all of these events and values and never have to touch a tag again. And that that's where this gets really strong because you can have it takes a lot of the, the very expensive technical requirements out and, and kind of extracts them. So the better your measurement plan, the better the structure you come up with at the beginning, the less work it's going to be for everyone in the future. Then when you have a new tag, it's as easy as uh, I just put that tag in the TMS. The values are already there. I plug in the values to the tag like I got with the implementation guide and click publish. Maybe preview first. <laughs> Always preview first. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so that's um, the data requirements. I see a question here in regards to if the data layer requires some JavaScript to execute first. So specifically with GTM data layer, it will be included with the GTM snippet, which does require JS. If they don't have JS on the page, we can basically say goodbye to most of our tracking. Uh, there is a no script tag that comes with, with Google Tag Manager. Uh, which will essentially load images with just sources on them, but uh, not as reliable and, and kind of a little bit off topic topic for this webinar. But uh, essentially, if you are worried about users with, with uh, no JavaScript access, uh, image tags are the only way to do it, which goes completely away from anything data layer. Uh, as far as the data layer, the data layer is written in JavaScript and does require JavaScript. In the Google Tag Manager sense, in the uh, when it when the Tag Manager code is initiated, it will go ahead and define the data layer for you, whatever you named it in that snippet. Uh, for all other TMSs, if you're going to be using a different um, TMS, you would be doing the data layer yourself. As far as I know, with uh, Telium Bright Tag, uh, which is also known as Signal. They, neither of them have an integrated data layer that plugs into them, so it's up to you to work with custom JavaScript and kind of manage these, but still having this centralized object and kind of having a developer come up with a custom plan around this. So we're going to have one object on the page, whether it be an object or an array of objects, uh, you kind of custom define something on the page that this is going to be our system and whatever goes into this object is our spec and that's what we read out of. Uh, so everything we're saying here with this plan, exactly the same. Changing, you could do state change with that object. Um, it's it's about defining a centralized place for you to look at uh, as far as all your state changes and all of your data changes and all of your data collection and have it in one place so that all tags read out of that. I, now, as far as actually initializing <laughs> the data layer on on the page, uh, to Tyler's point, it is you know a JavaScript object. So it does require that as far as it interfering potentially with other JS wanting to execute, um, it's not working in the same manner as a tag in that it's not sending up a request. So it's not going to be blocking anything else from, from initializing or executing on the page as well. It's a little bit more passive in the background. It's just creating, you're just defining an object and then pushing additional information to that object, which we'll get to here um, in a minute with the technical aspects of the implementation. On the off chance that somebody's technical enough to understand this, I'll give a quick explanation about what the JavaScript limitations are as far as uh, as far as the page. So if it is making an asynchronous request, we're looking at eight TCP connections usually. So you're looking out at eight possible connections. So at least thinking about tags, uh, and this fits in with TMS kind of work, you can have eight connections at a time. So tags do load asynchronously, but only eight at a time. So if you have one that's really slow, now you're only loading seven at a time. If you have two that are really slow, now you're only loading six at a time while the two are kind of clogging up the tubes. Well, with JavaScript, it comes down to how fast your actual processor on your computer is and how many cores you have in that processor. Um, so if, if you're worried about how much JavaScript you're trying on a page, it's probably not a big deal. JavaScript is really fast and lightweight, so you shouldn't be too worried about as much JavaScript as as much request. If you get a lot of heavy requests, 
uh, the tubes are going to get clogged per se. But uh, you can look at um, frameworks like Angular that are written completely off JavaScript with with thousands and thousands of lines of JavaScript executing in well under seconds. Uh, Well-written JavaScript is always going to go fine. So the data layer is in JavaScript, but it's very lightweight and it doesn't have an external request. So from a performance standpoint, you really shouldn't be worried. And a quick uh, plug, if, for those of you that missed our performance series earlier this month of webinars, check those out on the TAG Inspector website. Um, if you're curious about what Tyler's speaking of in terms of concurrent connections, asynchronous tags, um, and how requests and tags executing on your page might um, affect page performance in general. Um, <laughs> shameless plug right there. <laughs> now to, to jump back in terms of the high level, just the, the structure and the organization. So some of the things that you're really going to want to think about and you're going to want to include um, in the data layer are information around your page information, first and foremost. So uh, page and user information, and these are things that should be included when you're first initializing, when you're first defining and creating that object. Uh, things like this are gonna be, you know, logged in status of the user, your user ID, um, like Tyler had mentioned. Um, you're also gonna wanna start thinking about the different types of events, um, such as a form download, or a registration, or a transaction, or an add to cart for an e-commerce site. And with that, the different types of product information. One, the product information that is contained on you know, a product that's being viewed on the website, um, or even in the case of a content site, some additional context about the content that's being consumed on that page, maybe the author, or the title, or the subject. Uh, a lot of this, and it really comes back to it. I didn't mention it before, but a lot of these data points and a lot of this measurement plan that is going to be informed by your web analytics platform. So typically 80 to 90 percent of what's necessary and, and needed within your tag management or sorry, within your data layer is going to be dictated by the web analytics platform. So if you already have a measurement plan for web analytics, really, really leverage that. You've already done the work in defining what you want to be tracking, um, where it is, what are the different data points, and what context is it. So leverage what you've already done and really use that as you're trying to build out the architecture for, for the data layer. Um, this example here, though, is just very basic. You can see in that first object of the data layer array, just a logged in status, a page type, page category, user ID, user type. Uh, those are your very basic different attributes. You can also add in, like I mentioned, a whole lot more page context, which we will um, we'll dig into here very shortly. So speaking of those critical data points, first for the page information, you're gonna to want to start thinking about things like page type, your page name, user type, user status, and then some different optional items that I come across a lot for third-party tags. And again, it depends upon what platforms, and that's why I always say start with what is being used and what is needed for each of those platforms. But things like hashed email, um, that user ID, if it's captured, potentially geolocation of a user. All of these different sorts of page attributes, one, for some tags, yes, it's helpful uh, to be collecting this information for events or you know where are people on the site. But a lot of that can be determined simply from the URL. The page type, page name, page category, where this really comes in handy is as you're starting to get into conditionally firing tags based upon the location on your website. So if you're using something for retargeting, for example, and you're wanting to cookie users that reach a particular category page in order to be able to build a specific audience, you're going to need that page type, that page category in order to bake that into your firing rules for those different tags. Um, but that's, again, something that you want to just keep in mind here um, and think about holistically for the page information. The next critical piece of information that you're going to, going to want to bake into that measurement plan into the data layer is the product information. 
So your product name, category, SKU, price, brand. Um, you can also insert additional attributes for what is the stock remaining? How many items are left? Uh, what are the different variants of a product? What coupon is being applied? Again, a lot of this is going to be dictated by your web analytics platform, even the structure, right? So after you map out these different data points, um, depending upon the different analytics platform, depending upon the tags that you use, it might be much easier to manage these and leverage built-in capabilities. For example, with Google Analytics and leveraging their enhanced e-commerce capabilities, that necessitates data being in a particular structure within the data layer on your website. So keep these critical data points in mind, uh, but also think about that as it, as it comes to architecting. Uh, one more thing just on critical data points. Uh, this is, again, it's a little bit more specifically to GTM's data layer, but uh, a lot of people using GTM are gonna be using Google Analytics and they'll be familiar with Google's non-PII uh, information basically no personal information is what that stands for uh, data layer doesn't have to comply to that nor GTM uh, that's specifically with Google Analytics so if you want to put things like the person's name in the data layer or their email or anything that you've collected that might be getting fed into a CMS that can all be done through the TMS uh, in the data layer you don't really have to worry about any of this so uh, you don't see as much uh, PII in this uh, typically, we aren't working with people that are collecting that, but if you do have a need to collect that, uh, you certainly can do that through the data layer. Yeah, as far as PII restrictions, um, it really, most of those apply to the platforms that you're using, not necessarily what it is that's been collected on the website. So it really comes down to what your privacy policy is. Um, just keep in mind that people can uh, using like your dev tools and console um, readout of your data layer. So I always tell people to be hesitant before throwing in, you know, too much information there, but things that, for example, with a lot of Google products, it's against their PII policy to collect clear text email um, or really anything that's personally identifiable. It's perfectly fine to throw those sorts of things within your data layer. Um, and in fact, many clients do for the sole reason that they're needed to be collected in that format for other third-party tags. Um, so yeah, so you have a lot more leeway with it when it comes to PII and information that you're able to, to push in to your data layer because it is on your site. Um, additional data points here, just content information, like I mentioned before, article title, article author, category, and then events. So with events and what we're referring to here are things like product views, impressions, purchase events, uh, but also your form downloads, contact us, submits, registrations, any sort of user interaction that you're wanting to track or that you're wanting to conditionally fire a different tag on. You're going to want to have uh, what we call a data layer push, um, and, which is just you're pushing that additional information into, into the data layer. Um, so now that we've covered these different critical data points, I want to go into a little bit more with Tyler here, the technical implementation aspects. So I've seen a number of questions uh, coming in about, you know, how would this, how does this work? You know, how does the information get to the data layer? Where exactly does it need to be? Um, how are, do events get there and all that? So I want to dig into that a little bit further here now that we understand, okay, what goes into it, what needs to be contained there. Now let's uh, talk about how exactly um, that happens. So first of all, to start out, uh, if we're going to be using the data layer, the data layer needs to be everywhere. So on every side of your page, the data layer needs to be defined. Uh, I, again, I know I'm leaning a little bit towards GTM with some of these things I'm saying, but uh, if you are if you have Google Tag Manager on the page, it defines the data layer for you. It has already a built-in integration to its data layer. If you are using another sort of TMS, you are going to have this uh, JavaScript object defined somewhere else on the page, but let's keep it high on the page because we want these values to be there. Uh, and, and kind of what this slide say, the top of every page. The reason for this is, and I'll get to how this data gets there in a second, but just, just to hit this point, uh, 
if we're going to be reading out of this value out of our TMS, so we have like page level data, say the spec, however it got there, this object's gonna contain the page path and maybe some query parameters or other things for your TMS to use. Uh, it needs to be defined at the top of the page so that when the TMS executes and starts firing its tags, those values are there for it to be consumed. That's a super, super important point there. Um, and it's noted on the slide, but the data must be in the data layer at the time of a tag execution. Um, but think about it, you know, even in the context of what we were talking about earlier, where we're surfacing and making available these different data points. Well, if the data point isn't there, when your tag is trying to grab that information and, and send it off, there's nothing to send. So while your tag may still execute, it's going to be missing those different data points. We see it all the time. I would say probably upwards of 50% of the time when people have an issue with a particular tag or a platform not collecting all the data points that you were thinking that it is um, or that it was before, it comes down to a timing issue of when that information is actually being put into the data layer. So anything static, uh, to Tyler's point, anything with that page information, um, put it in when you're initially defining it at the top of every page. Thank you, Lucas. I'm going to do a little dance here where I try to go high level with some of these and I'll get a little bit more technical. Um, if I start going too technical, you can you can throw in a question or, or, or a comment. Um, but I, I want to make sure that anybody that's looking to understand how this really works under the hood, get some kind of idea of what's going on here. But I also want those that may not have any kind of uh, insight into how any of this coding works to get a general idea about what's going on and what the specs might look like to hand this off to someone. Um, essentially, the data layer should usually be an array. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, an array is just a collection of things. Uh, it's typically indexed from zero to the number of things that are inside of it. Uh, but it's just a collection of some type of things. In this case, that thing is a JavaScript object, uh, which is what we showed you in the er earlier slides when I was talking about attributes versus a value. So an object is essentially just key value pairs. We just have a set of key value pairs, and uh, then this, this array is just a collection of all of those. Um, the way that you add things to that collection is called pushing to the array. So the way that we get more information into the data layer is with a data layer push. So if you, uh, to kind of go a little bit deeper into your question about uh, how does this data get there, there, there's really two ways, but for right now, we're just going to talk about one way, uh, and that is the data layer push command, which is when when you fire this push with that key value pair, those values are now going to be uh, available in the TMS. So there's, I don't know if we have in here uh, looking actually in the TMS to read out of the values. So I guess this is a bit more for data layer. Do we have a slide for that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but essentially, uh, in order to provide that information in the data layer, we'll just cover into that now and then we'll hit what I was just talking about here in a minute. Um, in order to get those values in, we're essentially just pushing something into that collection. That something is a key value pair. So any of the attributes that we are interested in for whatever state we're pushing for, uh, the events that Lucas had just described, these different events, we're gonna push these different things. We need all of the information, all the key value pairs for that state. We're gonna push them into the data layer. And those are the kind of specs you would hand off to your developer. We've got a couple slides showing these. This is probably a little bit confusing conceptually to see in your head for now. Um, I'll, I'll cover the rest of these slides or, or these topics that we can go forward uh, and kind of reiterate. I think going over this twice would be good. Um, like, like Lucas was saying, uh, so if we're pushing in key value pairs, you obviously can't access a key if it's not there. So if you need the value from a key, whether let's call it user ID, well, if you never pushed user ID to the data layer, then there is no user ID to read and a tag can't use it. So it's very important that if you are going to be using values, if you're going to be using these key value pairs, um, you need to have them pushed to the data layer at the correct time. And this is kind of uh, looping a little bit back to the previous selection where we were kind of talking about the structure of the data layer, that you have all the key value pairs correctly. Um, and then one more thing, uh, I, hopefully I don't lose some of you on this, but the data layer kind of works with page refreshes and, and, and with page loads, and it'll automatically tell you when a page loads and things that are happening on the page. Uh, with the recent world of all of these new and popular JavaScript frameworks where you have these single page applications, 
that look like a page is loading, but the page never actually really loads again. It's just changing what you see in the URL and repainting the page with JavaScript. Uh, since we're doing that so often now, we're running into kind of issues with TMSs that the data layer solves pretty gracefully. Uh, just like we talked about, you can fire an event for uh, uh, clicking a button or signing up for a form or downloading this webinar uh, if we wanted to track that ourselves. Uh, just things like that. You have all these interests. Uh, you could also track virtual page views. So since that every time that page is repainted uh, by the uh, Angular framework, we'll call it Angular uh, or Node or whatever, any of the new popular JavaScript frameworks, each time the page is repainted, we can then push an event to the data layer called page view or something that's letting us know that a new page was viewed. And we can fire all the things that are supposed to happen on new pages uh, since we can't really use the refresh that we would typically use for that. Uh, it's just another powerful extension of the data layer. One second here. So this is what uh, establishing the data layer looks like. Like I said before, uh, if you're using Google Tag Manager, you will it will define the data layer for you. But sometimes you want to have values in that data layer before the TMS ever executed. You want these to be there all of the time. So this is what it looks like to just define an array with an object. These the curly brackets are how you define an object in JavaScript, and the hard brackets are how you define an array. So this in a, this is an array with just one object inside of it, and inside that object. We have the page type, the page category, the user ID. These red values are, are meant to be put in, uh, you know, dynamically. This is something that you would hand, you would hand this spec off to your dev team and you would say, just above the Google Tag Manager snippet, I want to have all of these values set, but these red values need to be dynamically <clears throat> inserted in. Go ahead. Speak a little bit to where those come from. Um, just... <clears throat> Okay, uh, depending on your web application, uh, these can come from a number of different places. So uh, essentially uh, the, the page type, it might be a controller in the back end of your system. There's, there's lots of different places on the back end of a website that this might be getting pulled from. Uh, we can say it's a PHP app and that uh, we'll, we'll call it Laravel, which is a PHP framework. And they might be looking at the controller to get the sorts of page information. Then they might be looking at the database to get the user information based off of some session level variables. Uh, and then for the logged in status, there also might be some uh, a custom script on the back end that tells you uh, what the current logged in status is and you have to hit that and get a response. Lots of different places of different things going on in the back end. But what the data layer allows us to do is to kind of send out all of these branches of our tree to all of these different places in the back end, which previously were not visible to the page or coming in in pieces or coming in in a Sherlock Holmes riddle. Uh, we don't know really where everything is. It's just, it's all over the place. And now we're allowing that we're, we're giving the developer respect to kind of reach out into all of these different places going in the back end, pull them all into one centralized JavaScript object and put it on the page right from the beginning, completely accessible to us in the TMS. And that underscores, um, <clears throat> obviously very complex as, Tyler was referencing and without using a data layer object within each tag and within each platform that you're running on your website, you're going to have to have that custom code in order to reach into those different areas. So even for something, you know, simple such as this, where we're defining um, five different attributes just around the user and around the page to be collected by a particular tag. Um, we would have to have custom scripts within the tag script um, in order to be able to grab these attributes and populate them and then send them up to that platform without the data layer being that one central place in order to be able to reference. And, and to build off a little bit more off of what Lucas was saying, uh, if you can think about even if it didn't exactly land or you didn't exactly understand what I was just saying, uh, it, it's it's a lot of work. You can tell at least from what I was saying, there's a lot of work to go to all these different places and grab all this information. Let's say we have seven tags on a page using all of the same information. Well, with the data layer approach, we reached out to all of these places to get the information once. But if we don't have a centralized place where we're reading out of all of these, then essentially it's happening seven times. We're doing these lookups seven times 
uh, to go out to all these different places and do it. So it's more back-end processing, which on a small scale is a joke. It's not slowing your website down at all. But as you go to larger and larger scales, you start losing seconds with all of these lookups and all these places. So by pulling it all into one place, we're not only giving a better structure, it's an easier structure to work with, it's a more reliable structure, but it's also faster and it's saving coding time to implement this. We had one, I think this is a good place to answer it. We had one question around like appropriateness of utilizing custom dimensions and metrics versus like events. Um, this is a, a pretty good visual here. So these different key value pairs here within your data layer um, are pretty much your different custom dimensions. And the way that you can think about it is your events are more of verbs on your website. They're actions that are, are happening. And it's it's the it's the actions or the verbs that you're wanting to track, whereas your dimensions or metrics or the is additional context. So it's like adjectives that are describing the actions that are happening and providing context to what has happened on the website. Um, and you can see that here with the data layer. These key value pairs here are those adjectives or those dimensions, um, and that's how exactly it's being populated there. Um, <clears throat> here is an example uh, just from a transaction page. So you can see additional context here to what's happening. Um, typically here on a, on a um, transaction page as well, you would be potentially pushing in an event um, and it would be just like, you know, events and then E underscore purchase or transaction events or whatever you wanted to name it. So that verb or that action would be that a transaction is occurring. And then all of these different key value pairs here are going to be your dimensions, metrics, those adjectives. So what exactly happened and adding in that additional context. Um, I'll let Tyler speak to a little bit here. Obviously, you can see here with the transaction. Now, this is an example of a data layer structure specific and necessary for Google's enhanced e-commerce. And as I mentioned before, in order to be able to utilize that um, built-in functionality of their JavaScript library and just being able to select an option and enable it. It needs to be in this structure. Um, so essentially uh, what, what Lucas was kind of leading into here, uh, you can see, if you see the word e-commerce, uh, it, is, it is a key where its value is another object, which then has two keys of currency code and purchase purchase has another object inside it, which also has another object inside it. But essentially you can see this nested object structure that goes down to having our, our ID for our purchase, um, the revenue tax shipping coupon. Then also another, at the very bottom, you can see there's an array of products that has all the products that would be involved in the purchase. Well, uh, th this again, this is specific to GTM, this exact object structure. Um, but if you're you're using GTM in a Google Analytics setup, you could just pass in this object exactly uh, and check the box to to use the data layer for Google Analytics, and you would then be getting your purchase of it. You wouldn't have to fire any tags or anything just by interacting with the data layer. Uh, this will automatically be sent. We have a question here, the age-old question of working with a client and the client's development team. Uh, does not seem very savvy and yeah. able to get the data layer um, a, approach. Now, I know <laughs> there's a couple of different ways that you can handle it. You can, if the structure is way too difficult, you can just tell them, these are the key value pairs that I need. Get it within this object in one place. And then with a, a little bit of, of technical savvy, you can restructure this and then make a push yourself from a tag management system. Um, any other ways that you would recommend? I have a kind of brilliant solution to this, if I don't say so myself. Um, when working with an agency like this, it's oftentimes hard for them to perceive exactly what's going on or how it's being used. So what I would do, and while it's not very normal for us to trigger uh, data layer pushes through the page, I would find whatever information I could scrape off of the page with JavaScript for those particular events. And if I could get the events in, I would then trigger the data layer push myself through GTM 
and then give them specs to replace that same data layer push. So as they're doing it, and hopefully they have staging environments, but maybe they don't in this case, uh, you would have to do a, a tandem publish when they took it live. But essentially what you're doing is you're showing them, okay, here's you could then give a training, like a half hour training on, here's this data layer push, here's this data in it, here's how I'm using it to both trigger and hold values in my TMS. And then I'd say, I need you to do this exact same thing and then maybe tack on a few extra values that you couldn't scrape off the page. Then as they're starting to do that, they'll, they'll get a grasp of what's going on there because you're able to show it with their own site in front of them, how you're interacting with that TMS and getting those values. You could essentially from there explain, uh, okay, well, if you can just do data layer pushes that match what I'm doing here, just with the information coming from the back end or a little bit more information in it, um, you, you can kind of from there just kind of uh, switch for turn off your pushes uh, that are coming through GTM and have them start turning theirs on from the page and uh, pull out the rug of your implementation and land right on a solid implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's you know similar. Get the values that you need. Big key with that is to focus on what's most important first. Yes. So it would be something like transactions, right? So you want to use Google's uh, analytics enhanced e-commerce. You need the data layer to be in this format. Um, you can use that custom JavaScript within uh, you know, your tag management system in order to get these values in some macros or variables, insert them into your own data layer dot push uh, and a custom HTML tag within the tag management system, um, and then be able to show them this is exactly what I need you to do on the website as opposed to through the TMS. I can also tell you, uh, while I absolutely hate scraping the page for data, and that's one of the reasons that coming from the back end of the data layer is strong, uh, I've pulled every single value on this page out before because of the exact problem that you're asking about. So someone maybe didn't understand how to get there or didn't know. So I've, I've done this, I'd almost this exact data layer push for a client before, and then said, I need you to do this from the back end, but this is how it looks. This is what it is. And I could show them on their own site, exact structure, which is, which is nice. I hope I answered that. Okay. For you. I think we can go to the next one. Um, so what we had just looked on the previous two slides was a definition of a data layer. I kind of didn't even get to speak around that point, but uh, if you define the data layer before GTM defines the data layer, what it does is it processes all of those values into a push for you. Well, earlier when I said there's two ways to get information from the data layer, those are the two ways. Essentially, it's always a push, but if you're defining the data layer before the GTM snippet, if you are working, this is only for GTM users only, uh, you you do data layer equals an array with an object inside of it rather than doing a data layer push with an object inside of it, uh, which if you, if, well, the slides will be available and, and you, you should be able to reference those and, and get an idea between the two, why we're doing the difference. I think I've covered that well. Um, but the uh, this is an example of a data layer push. And like we said earlier, you're pushing an object, which is controlling both state change and information. This is kind of for, uh, and, and like Lucas says here, this should be uh, after the page load. These are things that we're kind of interested in. Um, this is a little bit tailored. This slide's a little bit tailored towards sending a Google Analytics event. So uh, I'll speak around events, but this could also be for a user sign up. It could be for anything. So what you're going to do in your TMS is you're going to set up some kind of code in Google Analytics or in Google Tag Manager. You can set up to listen for certain event names as triggers. And other TMSs, you can't really do that, but you can you can always tie into your data layer, write some custom code that listens for an event name push. It's a little bit harder to do, same functionality, and still cleaner than any other solution. Um, essentially what you're doing is, so in this case, we have the event name. So we'll pretend that there was a user sign up and we want to send a Google Analytics event. So that event name would be user sign up, and then we could pass in event category, user interaction, action, sign up, label, he did great. Uh, whatever we want to put in here. And then we would then have that information uh, for any tag that needs to go off of that event. So for every user sign up tag, whether it's Google Analytics, whether we send something to the CMS, anything that we're interacting with, well, uh, this is what the spec looks like. Yeah. And one thing, uh, just to kind of reiterate with, to, I guess, simplify um, <laughs> what Tyler was mentioning with initializing the data layer and then pushing to it. Um, when you're initializing it, if, going back to our analogy of the, the bucket before, 
initializing it is putting that bucket down, right? And then the pushes um, are adding additional data points or, or additional items or objects to that bucket. Cool. Um, so now I want to, I know we're, we'll have about five more minutes, but just getting into leveraging that, your data layer with the tag management system, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, but once you have that measurement plan, once you have the structure, once you have the data there in the data layer, you're able to then really leverage your tag management system in order to be able to directly reference it, like we've been mentioning throughout, um, throughout this entire thing. So the main pieces of your tag management system and our examples here are going to be GTM just because I know most people are using GTM. Um, but you have your variables or your macros, uh, which are the how you're going to populate the dynamic values within a tag within a script. You have your triggers or your firing rules, which is going to dictate when your different tags are executing. And then you have the tags themselves, which is the JavaScript code that's actually um, functioning and doing something and sending up a request for tracking or doing some sort of action on your website. Okay, so this is an example of a variable. You would love to do this. Can I do that? Does that work? Yeah. yeah. I want to give an example. So if we're looking back at this push and what's coming in here, I'm kind of going to hop through these slides to make this really obvious here. So a data layer variable, this is referencing a data layer variable name. So think about all these values we're pushing in. These event category would be the, the variable name. Event action would be the variable name. Event label, et cetera, et cetera. So all, in, in GTM, all you really have to do when accessing something from the data layer is at the top, you can see this EEPDP e, e, product name. Um, Essentially, you just name it something, whatever you want to name it. Uh, there's some special character restrictions, but for the most part, you can name it anything. And then you name it whatever that data layer variable name is. This is a more complicated example, but for most of your standard pushes, you're just going to be putting in uh, exactly what, what the attribute name was. So in this case, if we wanted to make one for event category, we would put in the word event category uh, on the, where it says data layer variable name, and at the very top, we could name it event category. And it's just that easy. Uh, now we would be able to access that value whenever it's been pushed to the data layer. If it has been pushed yet on that page, then we would be able to access that value uh, given the variable that we just set up in the TMS. So uh, with triggers, it's essentially uh, listening for the events that we're passing in. So you see this custom event trigger. Uh, there's other ways to do triggers in TMSs, but when specifically interacting with the data layer, we're usually talking about custom events. And again, we uh, the word event is a special word in data layer. Whenever you pass in the event, then that is what we're looking at for a custom event. So in this case, we pass in event name. If we were to go to our TMS and then where it says event name, we would uh, then just put in the word event name, which is what we're passing in right now. And now any time that data layer push happens, that can be a trigger for a tag. This is a trigger set up ready to be applied to a tag whenever that event goes off. Now you can see these kind of squiggly brackets down here. This is a tag, obviously it's a custom HTML tag, and this is some kind of Facebook tracking uh, with that FBQ object. So, we see that there, this is some kind of spec that would be handed off to you from your rapid Facebook and you've got this new Facebook tracking coming into your site and uh, the, the content type looks like a string. Doesn't look too weird, it's got its quotes around it, but then content IDs, we need to pass in some variable for the content IDs, uh, something that's a little bit dynamic. If you see those curly brackets, that's referencing a variable that we've previously defined in the TMS. So if I go back two pages, this EEPDP product name is a variable. We've defined that. If we wanted to reference that in this tag, we would just put curly brackets around it twice and put it where it's supposed to be. So if you want to pull a variable into any one of your tags or triggers, I might add, you can use, you can use variables within variables. You can use variables in uh, triggers. You can use them in tags. Anywhere in the TMS, those variables will have a value. And that value, just real quick, um, to kind of simplify it to Tyler's example here for ecommerce.detail.products.0.name, um, the value that's going to return is going to be the corresponding value here. So what you're doing is defining the key, 
how exactly to access the key. So here in this with this push, it would be event label. It would return the value of the label. Um, and that's how you can get here for product SKU. You'd be referencing where that is within the data layer. Um, but what the TMS is going to do is grab the value that's associated with it. So this makes it able for you to put a static variable um, into your tag and return a dynamic value um, for each and every interaction. One more really quick point on this is how just how strong this is. If you have your backend team uh, with with some, you get some very technically clever guys that can come together and put data layer pushes together that have these dynamic values that are changing based off of the needs of let's say a Facebook requirement, and then you have somebody non-technical that needs to implement this. They can do this because of these variables and macros. They're, they're handed this implementation guide from Facebook and they know that their teams already put these dynamic product names and SKUs and categories in uh, because we had a correct structure like the slides that we covered before. So if you have an idea of what you need for your different requirements on different pages for event pushes and, and values that are being put in, then you can have a non-technical person easily put this kind of tracking into place uh, without it being too scary. And it, it takes the uh, expensive development time and, and kind of transitions it to where the people that are working on the marketing things can also be deploying the marketing things and get their stuff done quicker to not have to wait for a development time to free up, but also not have to use that really expensive development time. Yeah. So, yeah, I know we ran right <laughs> up on the, on the hour there. Almost perfect timing. Um I want to just circle back and see if there are any questions. I know a number of people are probably going to have to drop off here. Um, one question going back to the single page application, uh, mentioning that there's a virtual refresh event and asking if you should be updating your code so that the data layer fires on that event. Um, absolutely. You're going to want a data layer event push happening each time that page refreshes. And you're going to want to use that as your page view um, trigger so that you're properly counting each dynamic or state change of the yeah. page. I think also what you might be asking here is uh, changing values. So if you can think, uh, let me think of something that might change on a page, whether a user's logged in or not. Um, so let's say uh, at the top of the page, you had a user logged in attribute that was set to, to false. And then GTM ran. And we right now, if anything's at grabbing that, it's set to fault. Uh, it's set to false. Now we have a user logged in event, and we can push in logged in equals true. And then now that's changed. Um, so you're essentially you're changing values with state change uh, and and new values. So if you need to update a value, it's always a last touch is what the current value is. Uh, but that's really how that works. Every time the page is refreshed, all values that aren't like constants or set at the top of the page are refreshed. So each time we have a new page load, they're all refreshed and cleared. So it's whatever's been set on that page and then ultimately what's been pushed after. But it's done on a last touch basis. And when we say page reloaded, we're literally talking about the, uh, the whole page reloading, re refreshing. So in a single page app at, uh, context, you're not going to have that. You're just going to have the page state change. So in a single page app, it is important to keep in mind that those values do persist um, for the different variables, even on the page state changes. So the way that I would handle the uh, single page app, and this is something that we've done in the past, uh, is tell the team that's working with Angular, Node, whatever. Uh, all of these have what's called a controller, and the controller essentially listens for a web request and then paints the correct request. So you think you go to sign in page, it's going to paint the sign in page. There wasn't a full load, but it did hit the controller. So what I tell the technical teams is every time we have a new technical page load, this is a virtual load, but each time we're hitting that controller and a page is loading, we should be getting a data layer push with these specs. Uh, you would define your event name to be something other than what GTM uses. So I wouldn't use like GTM.dom, like you've said in your question, but uh, something like uniquely defined to you because this is a system you're putting in to deal with. Uh, they don't have, you know, native uh, uh, tracking on these kind of things yet. So you just name it virtual page load or something, a virtual page load event. And then all your th things that are supposed to fire on every page load, you would set to fire uh, on virtual page load. 
The only caveat you're going to face with this situation is whether you fire a virtual page load uh, originally on the first load or not. I would suggest doing it originally, telling them, yes, on the very first load, fire it, and then not ever use the all pages tag and instead use things like the virtual page load uh, tag for all of your things that are supposed to fire on each refresh. That way you don't have to worry about managing whether it's the first load or the last load or a middle load. Okay, well, it looks like those are all of the questions we have. Um, yeah, and I know we're over time, so we will go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we will be probably sending out the, uh, or we will be, be sending out the deck and the recording to all those in attendance and all those who registered. So uh, be on the lookout for that. If you have any other questions, as always, please, please, please uh, don't hesitate. Reach out to us. More than happy to help out. Um, with anything, um, tag management related, tag audit related, um, analytics related, um, feel free to always, yeah, reach out to us. Thank you all again for joining. Thank you all again for making this uh, collaborative and a very good um, experience with a lot of the questions. And we will see you back here in the next few weeks um, with our next webinar. Thank you very much.